The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another episode of The Engine Room. Um, we're on the road. We're in uh, Victoria, in Collingwood, and I am joined here at the desk with uh, with Daniel Harris, who's the Associate Director um, and Head of Advice in Victoria for the Grimsey Group, which is a business that's been going for a long time, and I'm really looking forward to unpacking this with you. How are you? Yeah, good, Roxy. Thanks for having me on. And we, uh, well, thank you for making yourself available. I believe you're heading to a, a, a growth collective with a bunch of like-minded individuals tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon. Uh, yep. Awesome, awesome. So when we're talking off air, I, uh, I always like to do a bit of uh, stalking, and I, I said there's a big, dirty big gap in your LinkedIn profile between the time that you first attempted to get a degree and then finding your way into financial advice. And uh, I suppose my first job for all the listeners is to backfill, yep. you know, what you did to start with. It's a bit clandestine, right? So obviously any laws we're going to break or any <laughs> anything like that, we probably can edit out. But um, yeah, how, how did you make your way into financial advice? Yeah, so um, obviously I said before off air that um listen to the podcast quite a bit and Kind of wanted. How no, no. To- you said you listened to the diary of the CEO. Yeah, a fair bit, right? And I said, <laughs> I said, I am ch- poor man's diary of the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but always wondered, I guess, um, how I'd answer the question if I um, was asked. But um, probably, yeah. I don't. I don't think anyone has a clear path into financial advice. There's only kind of a, a few that have kind of. Wanted that as a career path um, straight from the get go, and have done the the qualification, moved straight in, but. Um, my journey, I guess, um, started off in in financial services in, in a way. So um, finished um, school and never really knew exactly what I wanted to do career wise. I was probably more so um, really focused on on sport um, and um, applied to get into to university and um, basically um, got into um, a, a degree doing commerce and um, property economics. So more around the um, real estate development side of things and valuations and everything and decided to take a, a gap year and worked um, at the Commonwealth Bank um, under my uncle who was a estate manager in, in Queensland. Basically worked there for, for 12 months before I um, took up the, the degree and while I was um, studying, um, basically got the, the opportunity um, to do fashion modelling um, so that was, yeah. Pity this is a podcast, <laughs> ladies. And then, um, oh, no, we've got the video running. So um, so you've gone from um, from wanting to be in, in sports to, without a shadow of a doubt, being in the biggest blood sport of all time, yeah. <laughs> which is that industry. Um, and what, what, what brought, got you into it and where did you, where did you take it? Um, what got me into it? So my brother was just working at a sort of like a retail surf sort of store and they had some sort of event on and got asked to, um, participate in it. And there was a talent scout there that kind of said, um, you know, if you want to give it a go, so had a, a think about it and, and basically, um, 
Um, started off with a, a job doing a Mitsubishi commercial and, and then it kind of snowballed from there and, and started getting quite a bit of success in it and um, ended up working between Melbourne, Sydney and um, Brisbane. And as that kind of developed, I decided to, to press pause on my degree. and Because um, it's way more fun being sent around, hang, hanging out and um, and working for, for, for great organisations. What, what, what were the sort of um, clients that you worked with? Yeah, so in Australia, it was um, things like David Jones, yep. Meyer, um, uh, Country Road, doing the fashion weeks and, and that sort of thing. And um, Basically, ended up moving from Brisbane down to Melbourne um, and um, changing degrees to an unrelated um, field. So on the LinkedIn there, it says um, applied science, which is um, a, a funny way that the, um, I guess, RMIT kind of, um, it was a, a fashion textiles um, degree that was classed as a, a science because it was basically the, the business side of the rag trade. Right. Yeah, so decided to to switch um, into that, and I moved down to Melbourne to to both pursue the the modelling and realign to a different industry, but always been sort of that business entrepreneurial sort of um, minded person, and and both the modelling and also um, started my own business or company importing um, textiles and manufacturing for Australian fashion labels. That kind of kept me out of a traditional sort of job or part time job, and. I was able to earn um, money doing that and, and do the study um, as well on the side full time. And what from and so this was early on, early twenties, right? Yeah. So 20s, um, yeah. what were the what learnings in that industry? So one is the uh, the performance or the modelling, and the other one is the I suppose you, you're building the engine room or the infrastructure, right? So what learnings do you take into your current role? Yeah. So. Um, definitely, um, early on, um, dealing with rejection, that was a, that was a good one. So putting yourself out there and kind of a door shutting in your face and having to kind of readjust and pivot. That like was, literally, I imagine yeah, sometimes. literally <laughs> not taking things to heart, I guess, yep. but, um, in the, the business and, and running the, the textile side of things, it was kind of, um, a, a contact that I had that had a, a, a global manufacturing company in Southeast Asia and the Middle East and, um, the Australian fashion industry is not, you know, that big um, overseas, much bigger. And this this manufacturer was um, uh, manufacturing clothes for for things like Top Shop and you know large scale. So having to to kind of um, put a story um, together around the, the size of the organisation, start to really network from from nothing in Australia, and and start to build up um, some clients that um, could basically manufacture. Um, their and, and this was your own basis. business. Yeah, so yeah. Um, the contact that I had that owned that um, business overseas, his son had actually come from Dubai to um, Melbourne as well um, um, to study that same degree okay. where I met him yep. and we started that venture together. Oh, fun. Yeah. Fun. And so um, was you clearly then parlayed out of that. You've learned some lessons. Rejection, as you say, yeah. I mean, nothing's more brutal than being uh, rejected through um, what you're putting out there. Yeah. Um, when did you make the switch? Because I'm looking at you here, and you haven't all of a sudden become less attractive. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if there's an age, or is it? Um, is it the Leo DiCaprio over 25? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how it works. But um, what what made you move into? I believe you then went went and worked for a, a large organisation um, uh, in in financial services. Yeah. So kind of um, before that happened I finished the degree and I got the opportunity to to move to London with a, an agency that picked me up there and basically did it professionally for about a year and a half um, across Europe and then when that um, kind of um, journey sort of came to an end it was it was more a decision that I wanted to come back to Australia and um, stop traveling as much but also pick up something that was a little bit more mentally stimulating. So I came back to Australia and, and um, moved back down to Melbourne and, and picked up my original degree in um, commerce finance. Um, and then I got a job at um, NAB. Yep. So basically I had to go through a really big period of just re, re, recreating sort of building my experience again, um, doing um, some more qualifications or going back to university and basically started at um, NAB in a, a back office sort of um, credit role. 
got that um, sort of position and within two weeks of being hired there, they had a, a big national town hall and had been part of a, a big organisation like that for some time. So I was like, oh, this, you know, this is pretty cool. Yep. So I went in and, and it was the, the big announcement that the division that I'd just been hired in was basically winding up. Um, we well, had form of rejection, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so. <laughs> it was basically going to cease to exist in about 12 months' time. So, so was that a juicy redundancy check for your three weeks of active service? It wasn't a redu- um, juicy redundancy <laughs> anything. It was just basically um, 12 months of probably about 40-odd staff going away parties and um, – Picking out odds and ends and, and that's like of survivor. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, towards the end of that journey, I was kind of um, looking at well, what next? And yep. um, through a contact, was introduced to a business owner um, of a financial planning practice um, that had offices in both um, Melbourne, um, Geelong, Colac, and Hamilton. Yep. Um, had a discussion with him and um, uh, was basically out at dinner with him and and he basically said we've got a, there's a position open and, um, as an associate um, you start next week he, he pointed his finger out and he said you start next week and it's in Geelong and I was just like oh okay so I'm, I'm picturing the t-shirt you've got uh, Sydney Melbourne London. Geelong, so um, I'm not sure that uh, it's 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 you you did you move to Geelong or were you commuting? Yeah, so I started. Shout um, out to all those Geelong people. I do love you. Yeah, so I started um, work that next week. Wound up things um, at NAB. Um, I didn't have to give the two weeks notice because everyone was yeah. going anyway. But and you're probably over cakes, right? So. It was probably- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and I started commuting, so I was right. driving down from Pran um, uh, there and back um, each day, and having to play the the pump up music on the way down so I didn't fall asleep because I was doing the the full time study on top of that as well. Jeepers! Um, and then basically decided that um, I'm going to move, you know, down and um, um, Geelong was a, a great place um, to live. I'm a um, real big surfer. Um, so that was so you're halfway to the beach. Yeah. So the only sort of regret I had was um, the decision to live in Geelong close to work. And I was driving to the beach for a surf. Looking back in hindsight, I should have lived in Torquay and just driven into work. Like, what was I doing? <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, we'll find out where, what the future holds. And then you made it. So what year was that? Um, that would have been about 2015. Right. Around, so yeah. the person who hired you, who said you start next week, yeah. um, that business was sounded like it had a little bit of substance, you know, as a multi. Um, so what kind of clients did they, they service? Yeah. So um, typically uh, mums and dad um, type of clients, um, retail um, mostly yep. with a few um, sort of professionals in there. Um, uh, the business was predominantly built in, in Geelong, but then had a, a Melbourne um, footprint that sort of built to a larger business um, over time as well. But yeah, sort of that um, retail um, strategic advice, um, simple sort of investment strategy, um, insurance advice as well, but yep. really helping position um, clients for a successful and comfortable retirement. So did you So you went in straight as what's now known as an AR or did you spend any time as an associate or...? or? No, definitely an associate. So yeah. I was still finishing off my qualifications and, and I didn't really um, even know what financial advice was at the time. So it was all, apart from my own sort of um, interest in the financial um, services industry that kind of, you know, grew over a long time, doing my own research, yep. the study, and then the practical sort of learning side of things on the job as well. And um, when did you, so you then moved back to Melbourne proper yeah. um, and took a corporate role, correct? Yeah, so moved back to. Um, I actually moved into the Melbourne office of this current um, this um, business that I started in. Um, um, stayed there for um, uh, another year and a half or yep. so, and I was coming to the end of finishing my qualifications, and I was living in um, a share house in Fitzroy with my good mate, um, who was a, an analyst at a French investment bank, uh, working at One Hundred One Collins, and we kind of. I was about twenty five at the time, and it looked pretty pretty cool and the the types of things that he was sort of talking to me about and doing my own research and everything it was kind of like well I wonder if I'd be you know good enough to get into a you know bigger corporate sort of um, role again and always been sort of um, on LinkedIn probably too much than I should and um, just happened opportune moment jumped on LinkedIn and saw um, that um, Macquarie was um, doing a, a big national intake for 
um, new advisors or advisor advisors who had um, fascia aligned qualifications to kind of move in that direction um, to providing strategic advice rather than just um, stockbroking and, and transactional services. And given where you've ended up at, at Grimsey and the type of clients we which we'll touch on in a moment, was that your first real uh, taste of of people with more net worth? Yeah, hundred percent. It was it was definitely a big difference seeing a few more dollars on the um or a few more zeros on the the balance. But sheet. what about the people? What sort of were they? Are they different in the way they make decisions? Yeah, so most most of the clients had already accumulated wealth. Um, so it was more about um protecting it rather than taking unnecessary risk to to grow that wealth. Um, so we dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs and um um ASX listed sort of executives who had taken a lot of risk um throughout their careers and that had that sort of exit or realization event and and now is about sort of um protecting it and and building that legacy. So a definitely a, a different um, sort of value proposition and, and service level. And so you've you've gone um, from there. And Macquarie Bank, uh, we were laughing earlier, I think uh, um, one of your business partners, uh, at, at Danny um, Orlando, I met him at Macquarie Bank and it felt like, it feels like about half the industry has been uh, working in Macquarie Bank at, at, at some stage. Uh, so I shout out to the to what they've, what they've got there. But then you found yourself sort of um, – Moving into where you are now, which is Grimsey, which is a really established and well-known financial uh, planning and accounting firm and lending firm, which specialises in in medicos. Yep. So, what made you? Uh, I'm I'm going to ask you initially what made you join, because later on I'm going to ask you what makes other people join. Yeah. Exactly. What made you join? Yeah. So it was about five years at um, Macquarie, and. Um, I guess that sort of entrepreneurial side of me was always um, at me in the back of my mind and and really looking um, to come into um, different situations and innovate and change things to to kind of um, tap into different ways of growing a a business. And and there were um, those opportunities at Macquarie, but also limitations on that being in a bigger sort of corporate environment as well. Um, so I started to to really have a think about, well, what do I want out of um, this career in financial services? Um, do I want to just um, be an advisor or am I interested in the business of financial advice as well? And it was a kind of post-Royal Commission as well where a lot of advisors were leaving the industry. Um, that was um, sort of having a um, big impact on um wealth revenue multiples at the time. And I saw a lot of um, uh, privately owned um, business owners really buying up um, financial planning businesses for low multiples and doing a lot of research myself. So the the sort of um, um, strategy or how we manage money at Macquarie was both with strategic asset allocation, um, manager selection and tactical tilt. And that was a, a it's a well worn path these days, but back then it was sort of, you know, one of their st- stock and trade brand promises, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. And 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 basically having a look at um, say, you know, what's going on in the US with um, at the time model portfolios becoming pretty prominent in, yep. in big investment banks, and I was kind of looking at well, well, what happens if we took this sort of concept. Um, Moved outside of the perimeters of a, a bank and and had sort of like a model to to offer to IFAs, and I saw there was a few people in Australia that were doing that quite well. And Drum and Capital were one of them, which were in my, the same building that I was working at at the time. And right. and I was kind of looking at well, what happens if we took that concept, partnered with a really great. Um, uh, privately owned firm that had really good organic growth, focused on strategy, but then got the the scale from um, having a discretionary model portfolio. Yep. And the research out of the US kind of um, was really showing that um, inefficient businesses that were still um, looking at um, individual manager selection and tailored portfolios were really trading in that sort of four times um, multiple. But if you're able to re- refine the way that the business was running, bring in a model, um, then there was an arbitrage opportunity to look at really trading at at eight to it's ten double times it, correct. plus mod- um, multiple. So there was this big opportunity between that advisor numbers um, going down 
and then um, uh, the the demand for advice significantly increasing. So basically, went to market, had a, um, a number of conversations with um, with different IFAs, and narrowed it down based on one. Uh, was it imperative that I had to bring a book of clients? Yep. Or was there enough organic growth in the the um, the firm to to build um, a um, a book of clients or a, or a business that would sustain a, you know a long period of time? Yep. Um, as you mentioned, Daniel Lando from Macquarie um, as well, but there's also a number of other ex Macquarie. Um, Colleagues in in the Grimsey practice, one of them, um, Anthony Franklin, who was a, a direct um, colleague of mine, um, who was working in the business bank while I was at um, Macquarie, and he basically um, had reached out and told me about his um, um, sort of journey, and he'd joined the the Grimsey practice two years prior to that. They'd been long term clients of his, um, and he'd moved in there and, and really. Um, refined the the lending um, offer of the of the firm and um, made a really big impact quite quickly and and it resulted in doubling the the firm's lending revenue in um, about a uh, probably a two year period which is which is a, a piece of the puzzle that's quite underrepresented I'm passionate about but um, yeah. most people still have debt regardless of their wealth yeah so that was kind of the the um i guess segue into looking sort of outside of a um a bank advice sort of role um sort of i guess being true to myself in a way being interested in the business of advice and wanting to build a business well I actually write that down uh, do you want to be an advisor or interested in the business of the business and before I get on to <coughs> where where you sit right now on those two topics when uh, throughout your, your, your journey you've, you've worked <coughs> with a few people is there any um, one in particular or anyone you'd like to give a shout out to and I'll put you on the spot so you mightn't remember all of them so um, we'll, 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 we'll give a shout out but anyone in particular that helped you out yeah, so there's obviously been yeah many people who helped me out in, in in many different areas of the journey, but um, probably big shout out um, over the last two years, um, Mick Bequee from um, CFS. So he's really helped in um, connecting me to like-minded um, financial advisors and business owners. So he had a group of um, um, business owners that also surf as well, and that was the probably the first time in the industry that I'd kind of met um, other like-minded sort of individuals that I just got along with straight away. And that just kind of blew up my my network. And um, he actually invited me to, to come to um, a London study tour or yep. study tour to the UK, um, which was well supported by the Grimsey um, practice. And um, that just further um, enhanced my network and and kind of um, gave me an introduction to another person who's been um, very influential and generous with the airtime, which was um, Robert Coombe, um, who's from obviously CFS, but also Gen Life and background at, at BT as well. But within the Grimsey practice, um, probably um, the most influential would be um, Daniel Stefanetti. Um, so managing a um a director and and the head of the wealth advisor or wealth business uh, but also Paul Pettifraser as well managing director of um the Grimsey practice just for purely being entrepreneurs and and giving me a lot of rope to um well they said um at the start just come in and break things and um make it better and and go for it and, and well, well yeah. I'll ask you a question so how long has Grimsey been going as a as a company what's what's how many years yeah so we we had the the 40th um year yeah. um a celebration last year so 41st um coming this year and so why do you think they're so keen on you being an entrepreneur because quite often businesses that have long tenure feel that they've learnt everything and they know everything. Why do you think they have that attitude? Yeah, I think because um, the the business, well, first of all, all the directors are very entrepreneurial minded. Um, they can see the the benefit in um, sort of um, backing in the staff member to um, contribute, and it is a really inclusive environment, and everyone's able to contribute, and there's no sort of wrong answer everything's on the table for um investigation but really because the the Grimsey practice um for a long time was predominantly led by the accounting division um but as um financial advice or or strategic wealth management um has developed as a um a profession or um subject matter over time 
um, that's been a, a whole other area that um, has largely been untapped or yep. Uh, yep. underutilized. Um, so, um, or to give you an idea, that the, the practice has about four thousand odd um, households. I was just about you. You were reading my <laughs> mind. I'm like, well, let's talk about where where it's sitting now. So you've got four thousand households. Yeah, um, predominantly with, all medico. Lots of band aids in the in the closet. Yes, yes. <laughs> predominantly medico, which is which is when you uh, look at your business. Um, we'll talk about you've you've got a cradle to grave philosophy with with medicos. Yeah. So and. Uh, maybe give me an idea of of, of the org structure, because um, as far as what's the total headcount of, of the business? Yeah, so total headcount, including offshore, is about one ten. Yep, and um, in relation to the size of, because you mentioned that its genesis was accounting, but wealth has progressively, you know, uh, absorbed that. And and you know, your friend who's come in and helped kick kick the um, the lending divisions also generated stuff. So, what's the makeup as far as the the accounting and wealth and, and lending arms? Accounting's um, biggest in terms of headcount. Yep. Um, revenue wise, um, accounting was always the the bigger sort of contributor. Um, but now, um, just this year or financial year past, it's pretty much fifty percent um, accounting and um, both. Um, financial advice, lending, and insurance um, make up the other fifty um, percent contribution. Now that that'd be, that would have been quite a quite a, a a good moment because I doubt the accounting's gone down. Uh, I imagine that the other two have come up. Exactly. So accounting, um, I, I think um, you know, there's the two ways that a um, you know business can be. Um, constrained one is um, obviously not enough clients the other is too many clients um, and that's the the latter is definitely what um, we experience at, at Grimsey particularly in the accounting division so um, a lot of new organic growth coming into the the practice on a yearly basis yeah and take me through that so when you look at your um, the, the the philosophy the Grimsey philosophy you have um, you have a program for people whilst they're studying to be doctors and medical professionals. You've got a, 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 a so I'm looking here. You've got medical and dental students, medical and dental graduates, and then you've got the established healthcare. So uh, having family and friends who've gone through medicine, that that student graduate thing takes about eight to ten years. Yeah. So you're incubating them for for quite some period of time. Is that a big part of the brand promise of Grimsey? Yeah, it's. Um I think um, there's different areas of the the whole group that come into play at different parts of that client journey. When we're thinking about graduates, um, there's different, um, I guess, uh, services, products, and strategies that are available to a medical client. Um, when you're talking graduate, things like setting up for salary packaging, yep. um, also um, having access to um, loan products that provide a higher loan to value ratio so they can borrow up to 95% um, of the property's value. So, And that's been something that's been well established in, in, in lending um, uh, policy. Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, on the clear trajectory, and like you said, it takes eight to nine, you know, plus years, um, even more. Um, to, uh, like well, to uh, become just, a specialist, you add another four or five, and and look, you've even got um, things like practice buy-ins and a few other things here, which are which are, are relatively niche um, strategies, although used with contemporary tools. Yeah, so it's it's quite unlikely that a, a medical um, professional will will invest that amount of time and then leave the industry. Plus, they're always guaranteed um, a job. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of comfort around their trajectory. So they get sort of access to those different, um, you know, services and strategies. So really building the foundation of, of what um, they get access to. And 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 basically the first sort of um, um, point um, after they graduate, um, their income will, will basically start going up and they might make a, a decision to um, buy their first asset. So buying a, a property, a primary residence or something like that. So that's um, when our lending sort of discussion yep. um, comes in, and um, when debt goes up, obviously the the big um, engine room for them is their ability to earn income, and all medical professionals have have done their rotation in ER, so they know the um, you know. So they're actually telling you the life insurance statistics in front of yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's the other sort of um, yep. big important um, conversation. So protecting um, that engine room. Or- so h- how many how many people in the financial advice wealth business? 
How many uh, ARs? Yeah, so ARs. Um, so in Victoria, we have about seven. Yep. And the, the overall group? Yes. Yeah, so um, overall group, probably another um, three registered ARs yep. in, in New South Wales. So 10 ARs. And, and as you as you intimated, you've got you know young um, uh, medicos are very interested in things like leverage, cash flow, um, life insurance requirements. Do you, how do you manage the life insurance advice? Have you got a special team of people or does each... AR uh, have that as a module. Maybe give me a bit of insights on how that's done. Yeah, so um, historically, the the insurance um, um, advice um, was um, provided in, in together with the the financial strategy advice yep. as well. But um, kind of made the decision um, probably within my first six months to to split those two divisions out and have insurance as its own. Um, specialist service, and so of the of the ARs, you've got a couple of them, and two of them in in Victoria. Yep. Yep. Um, New South Wales um, is a, a growing business as well, um, so their ARs do provide insurance advice and strategic financial advice together. Yep. Um, the reason why we we decided to split it out in Victoria is we've got. Um, yeah, like maybe a thousand different sort of policies or policy um, owners um, in the insurance division. So there needed to be someone one to who understood um, all those um, historical policies as yep. well, the definitions um, as client circumstances change, reviewing those policies. And you need someone on point in claims as well. Yeah, so we've got a claim specialist, yeah. Um, yeah. dedicated claim specialist, but the real. Um, Sort of emphasis on on growth for the the group is, is really coming from the advi- financial advice division. Um, so we wanted to also um, free up strategic financial advisors to focus on that strategy. So, so are side you saying of that that I imagine historically clients came through the accounting and then into wealth? You're saying that there's beginning to be a, a shift that they're coming into wealth first. Is that right? Um, probably, um, so if we think of wealth as lending, um, insurance and financial advice, Mm -hmm. um, we're definitely leading new client conversations with a financial advisor because they're almost, um, a good sort of conduit into understanding the client's goals and objectives and facilitating the right introduction to the right part of the business. Typically, because everyone pays tax, um, accounting is the first, um, point in which a a client will engage the practice. But then, like I said, as they go through that journey, they might buy a home, um, protect yep. themselves for you know insurance. So that's where those other sides of the um, the business come in. Where my division more so comes in is is where a client starts to specialise. Their incomes might go up from a couple hundred grand to you know one one to two million dollars a year. And um, medicos love to to marry other medicos. So we've got a few powerhouse clients who own practices and and are both medicos and their earning capability significantly increases. Um, Their um, biggest return, and and we kind of talk to them about this, is focusing on their ability to earn income, driving that income, and then outsourcing it to get access to capability. So um, talking to, to both my team, but then that's when the other parts of the business are already sort of a big part of their life and we're bringing in financial advice and almost creating a, a family office-like approach yep. where a time-poor um, uh, professional client um, can have a full-service um, team in place. And do you – do you when they get to that stage, um, do you uh, have annual like family office-style meetings or what's it look like to be a client? Yeah, so depending on um, the complexity and size of the the household, um, it will either be an individual conversation with, um, say, their their accountant or tax advisor. It might be an insurance review. It might be a discussion because they've decided to buy a new investment property, so um, they have the the lending specialist at call, or it might be a review on their superannuation and and investments um, external to superannuation yep. with myself. Or it might be a formal annual review um, where we're not providing, you know, um, singular advice on any one particular sort of event. We're doing a, a full review on um, what are the long-term goals and objectives, and each one person in their team is providing um, that review on on their particular specialisation. Well, let's double down on how the hell you can pull that off. So you're you guys are self-licensed. 
Yep. Um, uh, the tech stack that you use, um, I, I'll let you drink your water. Um, the tech stack that you use, what, what, what's the financials planning tech stack that you um, – Yeah, so it's – obviously, if you've got multiple divisions. Yeah, it's uh, hard. Yeah, it's hard to, to um, communicate and, yeah. and um, group data as, as one whole – um, well, hopefully that artificial intelligence thing will 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 will, uh, will assist in that grouping of data. That's that's the yeah. There's obviously a, a lot in the market at the moment, yeah. but it's obviously um, around um, uh, being calculated and decide and doing the due diligence and deciding. Well, and what, what are you currently doing? What's your incumbent? Yeah. So um, the thing that groups the the whole um, business together is Salesforce. Yeah. So we made the decision. Um, Pre me joining um, Grimsy to to go down the path of um, tracking the whole group's um, data on Salesforce, so that's sort of the main CRM. Yep. Um, but what we're trying to phase out now is the fact that we do have individual tech um, within each of the divisions that we're still using. Like in wealth advice, we're still using X Plan, um, yep. for example. But the aim is to to fully integrate to to one sort of CRM across the whole business. Well, that's the noble pursuit. I imagine in accounting, you're using zero or yeah. B yeah. or <laughs> lending. You're using one of the the lending. Um, plat- what did you use your aggregator, by the way, in lending? Um, Put you on the spot. I'm trying to think of. Um, I'll have to have a read it because you've got different software, whether it's Flex or Sales Tracker or one of those, and they're all trying to talk to each other as well. Yeah, I'll have a quick squeeze. That's my wheelhouse. Yeah, so I'll come good. back. <laughs> um, so, um, and that, so you've got. That piece of technology, your self-license, which gives you the ability as you you begun the conversation to to manage your investments in a strategic uh, a way. Um, what does it look like to be an AI? So, of of the client groups, how many uh, family units does a an advisor manage approximately? Yeah, so at the moment we've probably got um, a couple advisors within the practice that have been there for over sort of five years, and they have an established um, book of clients. Um, probably looking between them, probably sixty plus um, households. Yep. Um, and then we have and a um, lot of people have got self managed super funds, I imagine, as well. Is that right? Yeah. So there's about um, over two hundred self managed yeah, super funds. Yeah. So there's business. different entity advice. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And then. Um, we have um, a few newer advisors who are just tapping into that organic growth um, mm-hmm. and building, um, I guess, businesses within the the firm um, organically. Um, myself being one of them. Yep. Um, and I guess just to give you a, a, a good understanding of of how much organic growth there is, um, probably over the last twelve to eighteen months, um, I went from just starting a, a book of clients again to now running about thirty households. Yep. Um, so, um, based on previous experience, that's you know um, probably seeing new um, client referrals at least like two to three a week kind of thing. Well, that I mean, and and the AR is looking after say up to sixty households and with with complexity, and how are they supported? Do they, you know is, is it in a pod system? You mentioned you've got. Um, a support team members here. You've also got an outsourcing capability across your different disciplines. How are you supported with those particular um, business? Yeah, so in terms of um, onshore staff within our business, um, each of the advisors will have a, a supporter and associate. Yep. Um, of those associates, um, all three are um, going through their professional years and yep. will become advisors. And I guess the the main the the next sort of um, thought is well, do we then hire more support, or do we look to fully offshore support as those PYs become yeah. um, revenue riders as well? And and where have you um like are your offshore provider? You've got twenty or thirty people there, is that right? Where where's that managed out of? Yeah, so that's um, managed out of India. Yep. Um, so that's been um, I think before that was the Philippines, but then it's it's been moved to, yep. to India in the last six months. Right. Um, um, and that predominantly services the accounting division. Yep. Um, with I think um, a single member for for the lending um, support side of things as well. Yep. Um, we don't have any offshore in the financial advice um, business. So, um, so your decision around whether you need to bring in administration or whatnot. Well, if everyone becomes an AR, then you might want to get some assistance. Yeah. So we we do have um, outsource capability, but yep. it's just not offshore. So right. we're big. So power planning, of, for instance. Yeah. So Padua, yep. um, which have been yep. um, an amazing resource to use, yep. and 
the quality of um, plans and, and the timeliness of them coming back. To so you've been using them yeah. BAU, not just sort of because they're quite um, well known for big transfers, bulk transfers, but you guys use them as day to day. Is that right? Exactly. Yep. 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 Um, and in relation to the, uh, you guys are in two states at the moment. Um, do you have any aspirations for growth outside of Sydney and Melbourne? Yeah, so Sydney and Melbourne um, being the, the the bigger sort of head offices at the moment. Because there are doctors everywhere. Yeah, there are, are doctors everywhere. I yeah. know um, so um, one of the directors in, in, in Sydney is actively looking at um, growing the um, geographical sort of um, – map or, or yep. footprint. Um, but I think there's there's a really big opportunity in the, I guess, medico space to, to look at targeting the regions as well. Um, Why is that? Well, but like if you think about um, sort of post-COVID, a lot of people, um, not just medicos, professionals, anyone is, you know, sort of um, made a decision, a lifestyle decision to potentially move to a regional um, hub or, or a coastal location. Um lower sort of, you know, cost of living, um, better sort of lifestyle and everything. And particularly in the medico space, so regional hospitals, there's a lot of um, government investment um, going into them. So um, one thaggy um, Victoria government is is investing about $200 million into the, the hospital rebuild there. Um, Warnable about um, three to four hundred million. Ballarat about seven hundred million. Is it fair to say that that medical professionals do like to work in environments that are like state of the art and professional? I would say so. Um, I've been um, obviously into the, some of the um, hospitals that do need a bit of funding, and um, it makes a big, big difference. You can um, tell there's a sausage sizzle out the front, right? So it's going to make sure you <laughs> buy a few. But um, now we were saying that in, in, in previously that. The big thing about medical practitioners is that they their incomes, if they're working in that system, it's pretty similar to what it would be in the big city. Hundred percent. So you're cutting out the commute. There's no difference in income, and um, you're able to, you know, how good would it be if you surf every morning and go in and still earn the same amount that you were? And so there's some CBD. subliminal programming. So <laughs> basically, you're saying to your managing director that 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 the, the next place should be the Gold Coast or Torquay. <laughs> Like so, uh, if if in five years' time, if we do find that this podcast will have worked, well, I think um, yeah, it might even be going in the background at the moment. But um, one of the Sydney directors, Daniel Lando, um, did an event up at the Tweed Tweed Heads um, near the Gold Coast and had a lot of success. Up of there. course, he yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. So you keep telling him how <laughs> successful it was, anyway. So um, when I'm listening to how you describe the, the business, um, how's the firm owned? Is it owned by by the management team, or what's the structure? And and do you build businesses within business? What's the structure there? Yeah, so structure it's it's owned um, by partners or directors. Yep. Um, about yep. ten individuals. And is that and is it? So you've you've joined a couple of years ago. When you joined, did you um, have a, a reasonable idea of what the pathway to get to that position would be? Yeah, so. I guess the benefit for me was um, the, the colleague that um, had the early conversation um, with me, Anthony Franklin. He had already been on that journey, right? Um, so I could kind of draw from that experience, and that yep. was a, a conversation early on that I had with um, both um, Daniel Stefanetti, Paul Pettifraser, and and Anthony Frank Franklin as well. Um, pathway to to partnership. Um, so I'm actually um, having those discussions next week with with Daniel. Um, we have had open discussions about it um, for the last couple of years, but um, getting some more sort of formal um, framework around what that looks like and and what the the offer would be in the next. And, yeah. and does that mean so when when you mentioned partnership, so does that mean do they operate as a corporate structure? So is there a board of a like is there a board and then there's um, divisional heads or, or, or C suite? Is that how how the business operates? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, a Grimsey board, um, divisional heads, um, exactly. Yeah. And has Grimsey historically um, done much inorganic growth, buying businesses? Um, there was, uh, so in, um, New South Wales, they um, bought and integrated a, an accounting, um, practice in the last, um, couple of years. Yep. Um, and they, they did in Victoria, um, try, um, integrating a, a smaller practice, um, um, in the last couple of years as well. Um, the real main focus has been on organic growth. Yep. Um, well, you've got to get these people with 30 people like yourself to get to 60, right? That's filling the capacity cut. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I think that uh, I guess the emphasis on organic growth is really getting our model refined and then um, being able to look at inorganic and, and pulling it in um, to um, really refined and working um, model. Well, um, well, can I ask you, and um, we can edit this out if, uh, if, if, if we want to, what's the couple of things that you guys, or two things that you guys do really well, world class, and what's the one area that you, you think we you can you guys can probably improve? Two things um, I guess we do really well is just knowing our client segment. Perfect, because you've got because it's been medicos for what part of the forty years? The whole thing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. So yep. That, absolutely. What's the other thing? I think execution. Yeah. Um, being able to actually put um, a strategy in place, but we've got those um, four specialist areas. Um, we're able to, like if you think about a debt recycling strategy, much easier if you've got a, a lending division, an accounting division, and a, a wealth advice division. Again, preaching to the converted here, I yeah. love debt involved in, 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 in wealth. Compared yep. to um, if the client had a wealth advisor over here, a different accountant over here, a different sort of lender over here. and. Yep. They're the quarterback who has to sort of um, champion the strategy, or the diplomat. Much harder to get through. Yeah, that's right. So, so that's what you do well. And what, what's something you guys think you can you can improve on? I think um, probably um, enabling um, technology in a way to make things easier, more efficient. Are you listening, Salesforce? <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> well, it's probably not. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's probably looking at. Um, oh, 40 years of history, yep. you've got, you know, a big business. It's really like change management's tough, bringing in a new way to do things, getting everyone to adapt to that change, but yep. then also using the technology to the full, um, you know, capability to get that scale. But it's let's, let's yeah. talk about change management because, you know, p part of the impetus or, or catalyst for us getting together was actually a a, a third party, the, uh, some of the, the, the team at Peloton. Yep. Maybe give us an idea of of – how they've facilitated that because you're right, a business with with that many years and experience and you've got quite a lot of stakeholders and I imagine quite a lot of A-type personalities in your stakeholders as well. So so maybe give us a bit of a feel of what you're doing with, with Peloton and how help, they've helped you change manage and what your your goals are. Yeah, so Peloton's had a really big um, impact um, both on how we provide services, but um, also um, how we charge and articulate value for those services so, as well. So which one of those do you want to go through first? I think probably um, going through first how Peloton came to be, um, how they kind of came into our business and the impact that it's had. But when I came into the, the business, there was obviously a lot of organic growth, but really had to peel everything back and look at, well, what are the, you know, the 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 areas that we can provide value to this client segment, what are the typical sort of scenarios that we see? Um, and then going out and meeting those clients and putting a, a really defined process um, and service proposition in front of them. And then once we had that and defined, well, who are the clients? What are we providing advice on? Um, and what are the services that, that we're providing? Then we had to really ask the question, well, how much does it cost to serve? Um, and how much um, uh, do we need to, um, or what is our fee model yeah. to make sure that we're covering cost to serve plus um, some sort of profit expectation, but then it's also articulating and demonstrating significant value for those services to the clients. So quite quite a lot to unpack. And, and so they, you guys engaged them on the overall company or just the wealth division? Um, started off as a wealth of vision, um, definitely. So um, they basically, they came into the business. We had a connection with um, Rich Abbey, um, who also I like to shout out as a, a big mentor in, in my career journey. Um, but Rich Abbey was involved in the Grimsy practice and um, brought Peloton to our attention. Um, so we, we kind of looked at whether it was um, worth pursuing and um, had an initial meeting with both Rich and, and Rob Jones and Rob Jones um, came into the business and, and more or less um, conducted um, so their upfront sort of service is, is, is pretty much um, in simplest form, just like getting an SOA for your business. Right. Um, okay. I never heard it described like that. That's great. Yeah. So doing full due diligence. Yeah. And, and this was um, a really good opportunity for me because I had to kind of find all the information to submit to them. And oh, so you were you were seconded as part of the the, the, the machine. 
Yeah, which was a great opportunity for me being new in the business. It just got, um, you know, provided me with the the ability to really understand the business. And I keep coming back to the quote, which I've written down here, um, interested in the business of the business, which, you know, if I go back through your history there, every time, um, even starting from early days, you wanted, you're interested in how the business works, not just what you do in it. Yeah, so going through that information really um, got me to really understand the business in depth and then um, having their report sort of generated um, got me to really understand. Did you have a defibrillator in the room when their report came out? You said that you're, a, you're a undercharging here, you're overspending there. I've always, yeah. you know, we, we, we bugger these podcasts. We should just re- record reaction videos to uh, truth serums. So what was that like? Yeah, it wasn't It wasn't too bad. There were um, obviously sure it areas. <laughs> there was obviously areas that we could improve, but um, I think the the – big thing that I took out of that sort of re- review meeting of that information was um, Rob Jones, who um, built a successful practice and had a successful exit um, in the Chad Forth deal, kind of came to the same conclusions that I did, that we're sitting on this really big organic growth machine and there was such a, a, a great opportunity ahead of us. We just need to really get in and, and refine a few things um, to start seeing that success come through to our division. And so what, what after you've... Do you have any idea of a – so when was that imp- – when did you begin implementing with them? How long ago? Um, so initial sort of um, process was uh, about three months. Then we came to a decision and both Daniel Stefanetti and myself put a, um, a request through to the board. Yep. And we got that signed off um, and it would have been about three months later, so probably about – um, a good 12, 14 months ago from today. Yeah, and has the that- change management played out to the full extent of their recommendation or is it still in process? So um, in the Victorian business, um, we saw a lot of success in um, repricing the existing client base, but then also having a really strong foundation of how we price new clients. Um, in- Was that confronting to some of the ARs who had been there for a while? I think, yeah, like I said before, change management's always hard. We've got two of the ARs, um, senior advisors have been in the industry for over 15 years, so really challenging um, themselves and how they sort of articulate value and, and deliver a, a client um, service model. But they've been delivering the value, but yep. it's about articulating, not like, not delivering, because you guys have been delivering Articulating, it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. right. Exactly. So Peloton were um, integral in... in um, coaching us through um, what the value of, of advice actually is and taking out any personal bias. And, and um, that, yeah, so it's not, it wasn't just providing a report saying, hey, there's an opportunity here, you guys run with it. Um, they actually step in and, and provide all the resources, um, um, coaching, uh, one-on-one meetings. We actually did role play together, um, going through um, client objections and, and how to actually um, articulate that value and, and handle client objections. Um, but after that whole process and we started um, implementing um, client reviews and, and readjusting their, um, their, their service fees, um, all of the advisors felt a lot more empowered. Um, they're having those conversations freely. Clients and were- And it was an all in, one in. One in, all in philosophy, was it? So you guys adopted this across the business and each AR then implemented that in their client base and did, exactly, the, yeah. did the profit flow relatively quickly to the bottom line? Yes, it did. So um, of the um, pricing reviews that we have delivered, about 90% have been um, taken up. And over the last full financial year in Victoria, um, so a portion of, um, a good portion of um, the Peloton pricing adjustment contributed to total um, revenue increase of about 40%. Wow. And that was a combination of both repricing, but then also having a really defined service proposition, um, bringing in managed accounts. Um, so we um, integrated Drum and Capital as our asset consultants. Um, so that which uh, is the genesis of your journey too. The yeah, firm. exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, in which platform have you have you decided to put the engine on? Yeah, so we, we haven't um, made a big decision of moving, you know, platforms. We, we Oh, you've got some nervous BDMs on, on <laughs> listening to this now. So uh, apologies for the unsolicited phone calls that yeah, are Yeah, so we, we did um, due diligence on um, all platforms just as um, best practice. Yep. Um, but um, 
for the moment have, have largely just kept between two of the majors um, where we've got about 50-50 split between yep. the two. But um, Medico clients, extremely time poor. They just want to see something and, and press a button. So, Well, the best thing about um, COVID was DocuSign or electronic signatures. That would have changed your life, I imagine, with those guys. Yeah, so that's kind of been our approach is just yep. to try and keep it simple. Yeah. So. When we're talking about um, working in the the business, uh, you know, coming, I suppose, being you really moved into it at the tail end of of, of COVID. Really, was just the, the aftermath in Victoria, which um, uh, we're st- uh, you're still sort of psychologically feeling. What's it like to work there? So, you know, uh, as far as the team, um, how do you guys have fun? Like, how do you, like if you 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 does me then knowing exactly what the uplift in revenue, which means you probably got an idea of what the uplift in profit is. So that's all quite dry and quite exciting. But yeah, if you guys hit your targets, what what's the team do to? Um, yeah, so Grimsey as a, a firm obviously started as a, a family practice and it's grown into a um, quite a large enterprise, but it hasn't lost that family feel. Um, I was saying to my director, Daniel Stefanetti, today that one of the things I wanted to highlight in terms of culture and what I've experienced is simple things like walking into the lunchroom, seeing everyone sitting down and talking amongst each other. And it's not just the same people talking with the same people each day. It's yep. interchanging and there's a real sort of family sort of vibe. And um one of sort of my personal mentors that also helped me move into this business said the Grimsy practice is great because they work hard, but they also play hard as well. Um, so we do have a, um, a fair few sort of work-based functions. So um, Tuesdays is an all-in day. We can work from home sort of one day a week. I'm in there mostly five days a week because I just love the people and love being around everyone. Um, we moved to a new office about – um, a year ago, so what? Why did you do that? Yeah, so the old um, building um, where the business was for about forty years um, got compulsory reacquired um, by the Victorian government um, to build the new infectious diseases. Um, the delicious irony. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we we were actually positioned in the medical precinct. So, right. Um, if yeah, if you're from Melbourne, you kind of know where the the CSL head office in Melbourne Uni up sort of that area. So we moved a block a block or two down down the road. And, right. Um, it's good to get away from the hazard zone, effectively. Yeah. And, so, and what what's the and, and it's interesting what the previous guest um, I had on the podcast they they recently renovated their office because they were, you know, you're now competing for people uh, for talent for them to want to come in the office. What 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 changes were made in the office? Yeah, so the the good thing about the relocation was a compulsory um, acquisition relocation. So the actually the, the government actually funded the the fit out. Um, so no, I can hear your I can hear your shareholders just having a little bit of a fist pump there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's 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 always good to. Um, I believe that the uh, the Victorian government's pretty good at, at funding things. So um, <laughs> spending seems to be their forte. So uh, enough of that. But um, so what, what what? But getting back to it, what's what's new in the office that makes it a desirous place, especially for younger people coming through. Yeah, so the the old office was um, more siloed. All the um, directors had their own individual um, sort of smaller offices and and it wasn't as much of an open plan layout. Um, um, teams or divisions kind of stuck to stuck to their sort of area, um, but now it's a fully open plan environment. All the the directors are um, on the floor, um, so it's very collaborative. Well, that's that's Macquarie used to be like that. If you go full circle, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You never even had your own desk at Macquarie in Sydney, so yeah. Um, so like well, we've got our own desk um, here, but the great thing is. Um, uh, as a financial advisor, you might need some um, accounting information on a client. Just walk down sort of the corridor, Perfect. speak to the client's um, accountant. Yeah. Um, but there's that really sort of collaborative environment where we can, um, like I said, that team approach, we can just go into a breakout room and, and um, strategize on some some yeah. other sort of, yeah. If I'm interviewing the accountants in your business, they'd be like, when can we just put a ball up? Because those financial <laughs> planners just keep pestering us for the latest information. So... Um, <laughs> No, well, that, that that sounds that sounds good. And when did you move in? So a year ago, did you say? Yeah, about twelve months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So when I'm talking about to people about their engine rooms and and how it works, you've given me that articulation. You've you've mentioned. I mean, when I when I'm looking at the fact you've got big organic growth, 
doesn't sound like that's the problem. You've got aspirational advisors, doesn't sound like that's a problem. Potentially, you're pricing it well, you're making the revenue, you're getting that front end right. I suppose the next thing that I can see on your horizon is how you can make this a, a great place to work for the people who behind the scenes. Yep. You know, the people that are, are helping uh, the associate advisors, the, the administration uh, team, you know. So what's your thoughts on how that's going to be positioned the next couple of years? Because I, I see that as the only growth constraint in your business. And how are you going to attract people in that role, apart from you know a new fancy office, yeah, definitely. And I guess a lot of thought um, has gone behind um, attracting and retaining good talent because um, that's really the only way we're going to achieve those ambitious growth targets. So one is employee share purchase program. Yep. So that's been um, a conversation, and and you guys are, are, are moving along that, and and maybe look helping. Like facilitate the economics of that through a, a loan, or what's what's the thought pattern there? Yeah, so um, if we yeah probably one step back from the employee share purchase program. So there's a lot of work been that's been gone into actually defining um, the career trajectory of in my division um, in all the divisions, but talking about my division in advice, where a staff member is at what the roles and responsibilities in terms of um, both quantitative and qualitative expectations are yep. and then how they can actually progress. Um, Who's doing that in your organisation? Because that's a big role. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, you've, you've got to balance a fair bit of it because that – that setting that expectation, especially for new entrants into the industry, and, and I, I mainly um, – well, the engine room, I, I interview best practices and, and a lot of them, again, it's starting to get it really, really well well refined and defined. Um, I didn't know that you guys had uh, an ESOP on the horizon, but uh, another sort of commonality of these businesses are that they are extending their ESOP outside of their frontline advisors to other people and other things. And that's because they've identified that that's uh, these days getting clients is not the pinch point. It's and getting advisors sometimes is, but it's getting the team to uh, share in the, the the game, which is important. Yeah, and I guess that's a real testament to the um, owners of the business right now. So they've kind of looked at it as you know they've been in the business for twenty five plus years, um, been owners of that practice. They've seen it grow. They obviously have an opportunity to to exit if they wanted to, but. They really want to um, give the same opportunity to um, the sort of um, next generation of um, um, influential people within the the business um, to get ownership in the business. So they're basically saying, "Well, we we want everyone to to feel like they own and own this business and can contribute and, and grow it." So that's the the reason behind the sort of employee share purchase program and. That's going to be um, basically outlaid through an opportunity to to um, invest or your profit share or bonus straight yeah, yeah. back into the, the business. So profit yeah. share, dividends, bonus, that sort of stuff. Yeah, so can, you can do increment. These things all need to happen, you know, because um, when I look at uh, it's the war on talent's pretty extreme, and it's not just a war on talent between <clears throat> your practice over someone else's. It's it's other professional services, right? So, and and these days there's no tyranny of distance. So. Um, and uh, having that overall package is, is 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 massively important. When I'm asking uh, the other question, which is what you're looking for as far as you know, a call to action. Um, starting off with four thousand, you said you've got four thousand clients. You've got a lot of other a business. You're now bringing these family units in. If if I'm listening to this podcast, um, is there any uh, where's the growth for people required in inside Grimsey at the moment? It's hard to find good accountants, so always a need for for new good accountants. Yep. Um, the real growth of the business is going to come from the financial advice division, and and like you said, four thousand odd households. We're probably looking at about five hundred um, of those households um, engaged in the advice division. Um, so relatively early on in that sort of transition of organic growth from one division to the other. Um, so. Really looking to um, probably tap into you know good talent and expertise to help um, build out that division over the the foreseeable. Yeah, because you've got enough. You've got it. You have enough uh, in the universe to be able to do it. So, quite an opportunity. You're just looking for good quality people willing to 
uh, pick and stick a career path, um, and and also. Uh, you know what's a, what's a couple of myths to do, dealing with Medicaid? Because we might we might we might sort of because um, uh, a lot of people out there sort of go well. I've got you know my client base. I've got a few doctors. I've got a few of this. I've got a few of that. You guys have been specialists, Medicaid, for forty years. What's a few myths to bust about how they operate with financial planners? I've seen yeah. So obviously I had the benefit of seeing. Um, or speaking with many different medicos on many different um, parts of the the journey, um, I would say a lot of them would um, are not necessarily motivated by retirement. Most of them love what they do, yep. And the financial aspect of it is just a byproduct of their success. Okay, yep. Um, Great insight. Yeah. So w- when we're talking about retirement to these clients, we use that term quite loosely because a lot of them might. Um, decide to just pair back work or move into a research role. Yep. Um, so, yeah, probably a myth is not everyone's just gunning for, um, you know, winding down their careers, especially yep. if they're intellectually focused or have dedicated their lives towards helping other people and, and the greater good maybe in a research or a cancer research sort of um Perspective it might be the definition of, of 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 pain. Not doing that anymore. Who knows? Yeah, and then probably the other big, I, I guess I wouldn't say myth as much, but there's a healthy split between medicos that are very financially literate and just engage us because they want access to expertise. Um, but there's also um, medicos that. You know, they, they do a lot of study and, and invest a lot of time into their craft. How could they be expected to to understand and master a completely other thing? And look, managing. it's a whole other podcast identifying which part of medicines, which one. I'm not going to put you on the, <laughs> on, 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 uh, the spot today, but it would be, you're right. Um, I want my anethesis to be hyper, hyper focused on doing their job. Exactly. I don't necessarily want them to be trading crypto no. as they're pumping the barbiturates in and out of me. Yeah, exactly. So there's probably that healthy healthy split, but of the ones that aren't as financially literate, I think, um, I guess, like I said to you offline, the, the medico, um, medical professionals are big advocates of outsourcing to tap into capabilities or, or referring to specialists. So it's no different um, to engaging us for our services. Well, that's 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 a, you know, that's on everyone's wish list is a client that uh, uh, is willing to delegate because that's in effect what we do. So Daniel it's been um uh, it's 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 been a very interesting podcast. I've been wanting to come down and talk to to your business because um having that that specialization genuine not just flippant specialization um in <clears throat> one particular industry um means that you get to live and breathe it and as you've said you actually your office is in the medical precinct. So sometimes you I bet you think you're in the medical industry that happens to be financial planning rather than the financial planning industry that's specialised in medicine. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I, I guess. And yeah, probably a, a big sign of that is that medical um, precinct. There's a lot of money being spent into that. And, and every time I'm kind of going into work, it's almost starting to develop like another sort of CBD. So we've got, the, you know, the metro opening up and a few different things. So I can kind of see that growth sort of um you know, happening well into the future as well. Well, Australians are getting older. We're, despite what people feel, we, we're pretty wealthy as a country and um, we're pretty keen on staying alive. So um, there's normally, there's a fairly big demand in doing that. So um, look, thank you very much for unpacking um, uh, Grimsey, the, the philosophy, uh, giving a shout out to a lot of people. Um, uh, one of your concerns when you were first starting, you go, oh, I've probably got a lot of people, I'm going to miss one. And if he's missed you, he <laughs> was nervous and he, and he apologises. And, um, and I've enjoyed my time today. And look, thank you very much for being part of the engine room which is all about the positive evolution of financial advice cheers daniel thank you thanks for having me